I won't go into specifics, just relax your body the way you know how to. Make sure your entire body feels a little bit heavy, your limbs are heavy. But do that while also making sure that your head and neck and spine are all aligned and straight. Hello time, sorry for the fusion today, we had a little hiccup. Oh, no, 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 it's all me. I'm just running late. Thanks for having me. So let us breathe into a deeper state of relaxation. Um, and breathe in some freshness as the air enters your lungs. And exhale relaxation. It will become softer and softer with each cycle of the breath and keep your attention on it. I don't mention that often, but if you find it difficult to keep all the breath, anything could work. You know, you could pick a visual object in your surroundings and just concentrate your sight and your attention on it. And if the mind wanders away, just bring it back to the visual object that you have chosen. Some also select a point in there so that they're not focusing really on anything. So you could pick a a point that is between you and the floor or between you and the wall and try to focus on that. And again, you wonder, bring it back to that one.
just realize it. Music in this world is completely silent. So here's another way of focusing your attention. You could recite a mantra uh, or, or aloud if you mute your microphone. Um, Om Mani Padme Hum is often one that is thought as a beginning mantra. It's also said to be sacred. So you just repeat it. Om Mani Padme Hum. that our 10 minutes are up. Hope you guys are able to relax a little bit. And um, it, who who was at the movie last time? I think most of you, right? Me. Yep. Yeah. How did you, we didn't get a lot of time afterwards. How did you guys like it? What do you, what do you take out of this movie, basically? What do you remember about it? I actually loved it. It was very nice. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. It was really touching. Food, food poisoning seems to be quite. Food poisoning seems to be quite a deal. I mean, uh, I think the original Buddha also died from it, and well, Mingyur almost. Uh, well, he passed out just in front of the the water uh, thingy. Uh, yeah, food poisoning, it seems to be quite <laughs> thing to die on, it seems, if you're in a weak condition. Yeah, in oh, this region. Yeah, that's what I was about to say, you know, if it's 40 degrees Celsius outside and uh, you live on the street with poor hygiene conditions, uh, <laughs> it's probably a possibility, definitely. Um. All right, so did you, any takeaway from the movie? Something that made you think and you went like, oh, yeah, this, 
this this speaks to me or this is how a master should be or you know anything like that yes. uh, i'd say that minger is uh quite a brave individual to uh, basically ditch <laughs> everything you know behind and <laughs> I, I i i found it funny when when uh, later at more at the end of the movie his friends showed up and wanted to uh, partake uh, in the whole thing and uh, he showed up with bags uh, <laughs> of uh, you know supplies that he bought all over the place I was like I don't think he fully understood what it was about <laughs> right yes well the, this is it right there's a lot of uh, courage required to go on a journey like that but at the same time it sort of starts with courage, but it ends up with serenity. And um, to me, uh, I, I don't know if I ever shared that with you guys, but there was a time in my life where I ended up living on the streets. And um, it was, uh, you know, my my environment say, it was like that at the time. and. Uh, I related when I saw Minger uh, looking for food, you know, because he was not receiving alms and everything. I did all that. I, I begged for, for food. I begged for money. I uh, I would also have a, a run that I had established. I would go and knock at the doors of several restaurants and ask for, for whatever spoils they had. And usually they would invite me back when they were closed. And they would give me a bag or something like that with, with the spoils of the day where the customers didn't have or what was about to go bad. And we would share that. And, um, you know, it, it sounds it sounds rough and difficult, but at the same time, you discover on the street a network, a network of friends. Uh, my friends back there were other beggars and prostitutes and you know, people who were just having a really bad time, people that were hiding from the police, people that were hiding from their families, or people that fell into a big uh, depression and could not manage to go back into society. They were estranged from their sons and daughters. Um, you know, just big, big challenges. And what happens is that these people, they either compete together or they help one another. For example, when we begged, uh, sometimes we knew that one of us really needed to take the bus to go and I guess I don't know, care or whatever. So for that short hour, everybody would put their money together and sort of give the, the, the alms to the person that needed it the most. Um, we would share uh, the food also, uh, we would share, uh, yeah, he used to smoke, we would share cigarettes or whatever we had to drink or to eat. And, um, but of course, sometimes I stood up on the wrong corner uh, asking for my own and, and a prostitute would come swearing and insulting me and pushing me away from the corner because I was scaring the customers, she would say. Uh, what is absolutely incredible at the bottom of the pit there when you are sleeping under a bridge uh, using your used trench coat as a cover and looking for wood around the city to make fire so that you don't die in the cold you know is that you actually find out that it doesn't kill you you develop strategies you develop uh, friendships uh, you it gives you a feeling of immortality in a way. You know that the worst thing that could happen in life, if you lost your family, if you lost your, uh, your job, if, if, you, if there was nowhere, nowhere to go and nothing to do to change your situation, you would still be all right there living with the dogs on the street. And for me, that's what struck a chord when I watched Mingy Rinpoche because I really related to that. Uh, it's, you know, it's many things. You, you get chased by guardians and police officers all out of all the nice places because they don't want you there. 
you get chased out of the warm places in the winter because they don't want you there either. Uh, but throughout all this, there is there is a lot of fright and, and a lot of security. I guess it contributes to a, a sort of fearlessness, and you end up sort of feeling like you're the owner of the of the street of the world like like you belong nowhere and everywhere at the same time and the title of the movie which was wandering but not lost i believe sort of relates to that so you see that's sort of the wisdom of the gutter <laughs> and um you don't need to be on the streets to realize that you just need to feel very very lonely very very alone and, uh, you know, if you feel extremely lonely, you are in practice just as isolated as the person who is physically disconnected from everything else. It's either physical or psychological disconnection. So I think that the street or those long-term solitary retreats that Minyar went through, they break you. Right, they, you emerge a different human being. Uh, you cannot not be compassionate after that for the people that live on the street. You you have to understand everybody and uh, and welcome them with open arms. So that was one of my journeys way before I encountered Buddhism. It's quite young that happened. I've always been, ironically, I've always been grateful for it. Um, I think it gave me a lot of uh, trust in life. Uh, foolish trust is thinking that my friend here will be reliable forever. Like he will never be weak, he will never betray me. I trust in him because he's my friend that's full distress but wise trust is when you can trust in the insecurity you can trust in the unpredictability of life you know that the only constant is that it's going to change all the time and that you are ready to embrace this change so i i'd say that's one of the big teachings from ninger's journey there that he, he's been prepared to encounter anything, to dance with anything, food or not, good weather or not, uh, roof or not, friends or not, right? And um, by going to these extremes, then the little mishaps of daily life have become quite manageable. So I am by no means advising <laughs> anybody to go live on the street, but. Um, to put yourself in a situation, even if it's for a week or a month, where you are basically cut from the world, uh, can help as long as you're prepared. We've seen that during the pandemic, a lot of people were driven nuts by the isolation. Those that never really uh, were accustomed to be by themselves found it very, very hard. But they didn't have a chance, and I bet they grew through this as well. So these were my my two cents about uh, this movie. Um, I, I hope you find your ways to increase your freedom and and, and push your limits, uh, your own personal flavor of it in your life, because. Uh, it, it's like changing the ball for the fish, right? It allows the fish to grow. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, still the, the Sangha, and we're starting a chapter called Building a Buddha Land. So, so basically, it's about the community of people that are seeking enlightenment, are finding it. And uh, since uh, Julia is not there on this one, of you is prepared to read, I will probably just proceed myself. Is that okay? All right. You guys are quiet. 
<laughs> All right, so the harmony. You asked a question? Uh, yeah, I was asking if somebody wanted to read or if I should proceed myself. Because I don't have Julia today, who's usually here. Um, yeah, maybe no. I can read, but. It's okay, you can yeah, read. Yeah, you know. <laughs> okay. All right, so. Um, it starts with, let us imagine a desert country lying in absolute darkness with many living things swarming blindly about. Naturally, they will be frightened. As they run about without recognizing one another during the night, there will be frequent squirming and loneliness. This is indeed a pitiful sight. Then let us imagine that suddenly a superior person with a torch appears and everything around becomes bright and clear. The living beings in dark solitude suddenly find great relief as they look about to recognize one another and happily share their companion. By a desert country is meant a world of human life where it lies in the darkness of ignorance. Those who have no light of wisdom in their minds wander about in loneliness and fear. They were born alone and die alone. They do not know how to associate with their fellow human peaceful. And they are naturally despondent and fearful. By a superior person with torch is meant Buddha, assuming a human form. And by his wisdom and compassion, he illumines the world. In this light, people find themselves as well as others and are glad to establish human fellowship and harmonious relations. Thousands of people may live in a community, but it is not one of real fellowship until they know each other and have sympathy for one another. True community has faith and wisdom that illumines. It is a place where the people know and trust one another and where there is social harmony. In fact, harmony is the life and real meaning of a true community or organization. So just one little commentary about this first segment. Is that the Buddha here is displayed as a superior person with a torch and People, you can imagine that the people that were afraid and in the dark, they sort of gather around the Buddha to be in the light of that torch. And this is what often happens uh, in spiritual communities. A lot of people gather around the master, but they forgot, they forget to turn on their own lights. And so when the master is there, they flock around him. And when he's not there, then they go back to being scared because they don't know how to use their own flashlights. So it creates sort of a dependency and, and a reliance on the master, which is not very conducive uh, to self-development and growth. So it's just, a, I guess, a little word of warning there um, to not fall into that that trap that you need to be a light upon yourself. It's okay in the beginning to be shown the way and, and to actually sort of get a, an idea of what the light looks like. But eventually uh, our path should be about working, uh, about finding ways to turn on our own flashlight. And Jared wrote something interesting in the, in the Discord recently about a spotlight on, on the wall. Um, what? How did it go, Jared? What you wrote? Um, I can't remember. It was a quote from a TV show called Babylon Five. That <laughs> guy got enlightened. Babylon oh, Five. Okay. Yeah, Babylon Five. You know that one? I love it. Yeah, me too. Yes. Yeah, I, I like sci-fi as well. Uh, if I remember, and probably I'm going to misquote it, but you wrote that the, the, the light on the wall was the light sort of produced by our search. Or something like ah, that. Ah, yes, yes, yes. It yeah, was this, much. yes. So, 
I, I think it's a nice image. I would. I just wanted to add on top of that that actually it's not the search that produces the light. You have the light already. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to search, right? Your awareness is already yeah. there. Your awareness can be shone upon anything. So basically, you are the light. You are just learning to use it, You're just uncovering. It. And uh, so yeah, the quote was scared. much longer. They want to post it all. Yeah. Uh, spirituality, I guess, I'm trying to point out, is not really about the searching. It's more about the finding, right? So, so don't search for, um, don't, don't try and, and find out how to, to become enlightened in the future. Just be it now, you know? Try to live in such a way that your um, non-ego can express itself, your non-being. It's funny that we are all born from non-being and from no mind. These are just the mind. It's just the stuff that we're adding on top of who we are with time. And Buddhism is pretty much about just digging them back. So I guess just know that you have it and you don't need somebody else's light. You just need to let yours through. Um, all right, so following up with the lecture. Of organizations, there are three kinds. First, there are those that are organized on the basis of the power, wealth, or authority of the great leaders. Second, there are those that are organized because of its convenience to the members, which will continue to exist as long as the members satisfy their conveniences and do not quarrel. Third, there are those that are organized with some good teachings at its center and harmony as its very life. Of course, the third or last of these is the only true organization, for in it the members live in one spirit, from which the unity of spirit and various kinds of virtue will arise. In such an organization, there will prevail harmony, satisfaction, and happiness. Enlightenment is like rain that falls on a mountain and gathers into rivulets that run into brooks and then into rivers which finally flow into the ocean. The rain of the sacred teaching falls on all people alike without regard to their conditions or circumstances. Those who accept it gather into small groups, then into organizations, then into communities, and finally find themselves in the great ocean of enlightenment. The minds of these people mix like milk and water finally organize into a harmonious brotherhood. Thus, the true teaching is the fundamental requirement of a perfect organization. And as mentioned above, it is the light which enables people to recognize one another, to become adjusted to one another, and to soothe out the rough places in their thinking. Thus, the organization that is formed on the perfect teachings of Buddha can be called the Sangha. They should observe these teachings and train their minds accordingly. Thus, the Buddha Sangha will theoretically include everyone, but in fact, only those who have the same religious faith are members. I have not much to say about this. The Buddha Sangha will have two types of members. There will be those who are teaching the lay members and those who are supporting the teachers by offering the needed food and clothing. They uh, together will disseminate and perpetuate the teaching. And by the way, if I can point out, I, I need some new underwear. So if anybody wants to donate. <laughs> uh, then to make the Sangha complete, there must be perfect harmony among the members. The teachers teach the members, and the members honor the teachers so that there can be harmony between them. Members of the Buddha Sangha should associate together with affectionate sympathy, being happy to live together with fellow followers and seeking to become one spirit. 
There are six things that will help to lead the Sangha to harmony. They are first, sincerity of speech. Second, sincerity and kindness of action. Third, sincerity and sympathy of spirit. Fourth, equal sharing of common property. Fifth, following the same pure precepts. And sixth, all having right use. Among these things, the sixth of all having right views forms the nucleus, with the other five serving as wrappings for it. So the, the right view is what I often call the eyes of enlightenment. If you can really open your eyes to what Buddhism called the ultimate truth, you don't really need a book anymore. You will simply find a way to reconnect with those that have their eyes open as well because your outlook on reality is pretty much the same and will keep on developing in the same way. There are two sets of seven rules to be followed if the brotherhood is to be successful. The first is, as a group, one, they should gather together frequently to listen to the teachings and to discuss them. Two, they should mingle freely and respect one another. Three, they should revere the teaching and respect the rules and not change them. Four, elder and younger members are to treat each other with courtesy. Five, they should let sincerity and reverence mark their bearing. Six, they should purify their minds in a quiet place which they should nevertheless offer to others before taking it for themselves. Seven, they should love all people treat visitors cordially, and console the sick with kindness. A Sangha that follows these rules will never decline. So, you know, we don't have a lot of rules as this VR Sangha. And I think we are living that anyway. I, I think I see that members are pretty respectful to one another. I've seen some help being given and received. People are coming back over long periods of time. It's uh, it's going to be a year soon that have started this, and I can see some things that were there at the very beginning. So that is awesome, and the community is only growing. Wish I had more time actually to expand our little community. But um, I'm happy with the way that it grows. You probably have seen that the, the trolls and the troublemaker just sort of fell off. We never threw them away. We never did anything bad. We never yelled back. And they just stopped coming. Right? So only those that belong, that share the, the, the project, the, this growth project, this aspiration for less suffering or joy, more, more light uh, remaining, and I am grateful for that. We're too grateful, thank so, you. <laughs> yeah, Malka, you're among the, the ones that were there very early on, and it's good to still have you. Um, second yep. set of seven <laughs> is um, each individual should maintain a pure spirit and not ask for too many things. Two, maintain integrity and remove all greed. Three, be patient and not argue. Four, keep silent and not talk idly. Five, submit to the regulations and not be overbearing. Six, maintain an even mind and not follow different teachings. And seven, be thrifty and frugal in daily living. If its members follow these rules, the Sangha will endure and never decline. As mentioned above, the Sangha should maintain harmony in its very essence. Therefore, one without harmony cannot be called a brotherhood. Each member should be on guard not to be the cause of discord. If discord appears, it should be removed as early as possible or discord will soon ruin any organization. Blood stains cannot be removed by more blood. 
resentment cannot be removed by more resentment. Resentment can be removed only by forgetting it. Once there was a king named Calamity, Calamity, whose country was conquered by a neighboring warlike king named Ramadatta. King Calamity, after hiding with his wife and son for a time, was captured, but fortunately his son, the prince, could escape. The prince tried to find some way of saving his father, but in vain. On the day of his father's execution, the prince in disguise made his way into the execution ground, where he could do nothing but watch in mortification the death of his ill-fated father. The father noticed his son um, in the crowd and muttered as if talking to himself, do not search for a long time, do not ask, do not act hastily. Resentment can be calmed only by forgetting. Afterward, the prince sought after some way of revenge for a long time. At last, he was employed as an attendant in Ramadatta's palace and came to win the king's favor. On a day when the king went hunting, hunting uh, the prince sought some opportunity for revenge. The prince was able to lead his master into a lonely place, and the king, being very wary, fell asleep with his head on the lap of the prince. So only had he come to trust, to trust the prince. The prince drew his dagger and placed it at the king's throat, but then hesitated. The words his father had expressed at the moment of his execution flashed into his mind, and although he tried again, he could not kill the king. Suddenly, the king awoke and told the prince that he had had a bad dream in which the son of King Calamity was trying to kill him. The prince, flourishing uh, the dagger in his hand, hastily grasped the king and, identifying himself as the son of King Calamity, declared that the time had finally come for him to avenge his father. Yet he could not do so, and suddenly he cast his dagger down and fell on his knees in front of the, the king. When the king heard the prince's story and the final words of his father, he was very impressed and apologized to the king, to, to the prince. Later, he restored the former kingdom to the prince, and their two countries came to live in friendship for a the dying words of King Calamity, do not search for a long time, mean that resentment should not be cherished for long. And do not act hastily means that friendship should not be broken hastily. Resentment cannot be satisfied by resentment. It can only be removed by forgetting. In the fellowship of a brotherhood that is based on the harmony of right teaching, Every member should always appreciate the spirit of this story. Not only the members of the Brotherhood, but also people in general should appreciate and practice the spirit in their daily life. That's it. They, uh, about this thing there, about resentment. There's somebody this week posting in, in a forum that I follow a question that went like this. How, like, what should I do uh, when somebody wronged me and they just don't care? Right. So the person was angry for something that had happened, but the protagonist, the one that had done the bad deed, actually didn't give a darn. And the person was frustrated by it. Okay. What would you guys do in a situation like that, where you have been wronged by someone and you would like them to lament it or recognize it, but they just don't? What do you think is the best course of action? To say, may we all be free from suffering? So there is suffering. I'm, I'm, what you're saying is that I am suffering as a result of their action and I want to free myself. Yes, and the other person suffers too. Hmm. Right. Yeah, pretty much now. Take your time and process it all. And forgive them. 
Mm -hmm. right. Can it also depend on the situation? Like, like, yeah, if it's something like your roommate example. didn't take out the trash, then well, I can forgive that. <laughs> I can look away. Mm -hmm. But there are some cases where I wouldn't be able to look away and I would have to confront them. Now, of course, I wouldn't... Like, if, if it's a big enough situation, it wouldn't be a hill I would die on. But I would confront them, just so that they try not to do it again in the future. So you would try to an example. make them aware? Or yeah, I, I would try to you, make them aware. Is the aware. idea to make them aware or to express your rage? I guess. Uh, to make them aware so they don't do it in the future. Not so you feel better by, you know, <laughs> raging at them. I didn't uh, understand uh, what Jared said and what you replied to him. Can you please repeat? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Malka, I, I guess... I guess it depends on the situation, right? Like I said, the trash example... I, I yes, yeah, so I just didn't that hear much. that, I'm sorry. Yeah, and for, um, for something bigger, like, um... Uh, I don't know, maybe somebody offending uh, your family, like, um, I don't I know, said, let's say you... It's pretty much for, forgive and forget. Uh, yeah, I, 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 most of the time um, that's what I would choose as well. As a response to somebody that accusing us for well, doing yeah. something wrong. Did I get, um, get it right? Well, in this case, they're not accusing us for doing yeah, anything so wrong. It's, it's more like okay. we're like, <laughs> uh, somebody else did something wrong, right? And you're wondering whether you should just say nothing. Or maybe we can try and, and improve our faults because if we actually wasn't okay towards someone or we own this person money or something like that, so there is ways that we can reach this person still and say, we are truly sorry for any suffering that we have caused. Like, is there anything that we can do right now, you know? Yes. All right. So I, I feel like there's been a few uh, glitchy communication connections in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to try and bring it into <laughs> a uh, coherent whole. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, and there's a lot of good answers, so it's very interesting. So, Disco was saying, look, um, uh, I, I will more readily forgive some uh, offenses than, than others. There are trivial stuff like taking the trash out. If they forget to do that, who cares, right? But if they have, I don't know, like killed my brother, then I might have a harder time uh, forgiving that. And I should have a talk with them at the very least to make them aware of the... Of of the hurt that they have caused. Um, Malka was saying earlier uh, that, you know, when somebody has hurt you and you're angry, well, you are suffering. So it's a good thing that you, to be aware and to release that suffering that we're experiencing. But I think I understood that she was saying that the, the person that did the hurt is also suffering. So probably uh, we should be compassionate towards them. Hey, New Jax, what a surprise. How are you? Hi, everyone. It's really good to be here. Hello. Hello. I'm well, thanks. Hello. Joining from Austria All today. Right. Yeah, that's what I was wondering if you were on site now. So, see, this session time is also convenient for you now, world traveler. <laughs> well, I normally have our company meeting, but I decided to take a day off today. So, that's why I got to join you. Oh. Awesome. Well, uh, we were talking about anger and, uh, you know, the fact that um, sometimes we, we hold on to our anger and it can be even more frustrating if the person I am angry at is not feeling any remorse or is not doing anything about it. Um, so there's this fable that we have uh, read together a long time ago about the two-headed snake uh, who is... Uh, the, the two heads, they start fighting. They have a disagreement and they start fighting. And uh, one of the heads becomes so angry that she says, okay, well, if, you, if I can't have it, you won't have it either. And it bites into poison. And both heads die as a result. So I, I feel that anger and resentment is often like that. It's uh, Or as one, of, one famous lama put it, it's 
it's a, a violence that you do to yourself for something that somebody else has done, right? It's like a punishment that you inflict on yourself for something that somebody else has done. So sure, uh, you, you can make them aware, you can have a talk with them, you can still use your 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 logic and, and express yourself uh, wholly about the subject. What's important is that you are not cultivating the bile, that you are not staying in a mindset uh, of, of suffering while the person that actually did or created the problem lives in bliss. Right? And that's exactly the, the, the question that this person was asking. You could see that this person was still angry, but that the, the person that caused the problem didn't care. So who's suffering now, you know? <laughs> the wrong person, basically. And and this person was keeping herself in that situation. So we, we have to be careful with any sticky emotions, any sticky thought. And what is great is that in, in our shamatha, in our breathing meditation, or you see today I was playing with the with mantras and visual objects. The reason for that is that we are we are being king-like with our mind. We are deciding what our mind should focus on. We are the emperors of our lives, right? That's what you learn through Buddhism, to govern yourself and your inner life. And so uh, if I catch myself in bitterness and resentment, then this is where I need to use my king-like powers and shift my mindset into something uh, probably more positive or constructive. It doesn't need to be positive. It just needs not to be negative, basically. It just needs to be wholesome and harmonious. I guess that's what's important. Anyway, you know, these are uh, just little points as to how to build a successful brotherhood, I think, within... Uh, or sisterhood. I think we've been doing a great job uh, at that so far, and uh, there's not much more I'd like to say about it, but I wanted to hear from you guys this week. How how was your week? What are the, the challenges? Jared, I know you were speaking a little bit about, about your own before the session. Didn't really mm -hmm. get a good chance to hear you. Would you like to revisit that a little bit, see if we can help? Uh, no, not really. Okay. All right. Not right now. Yes. I'm actually getting no really problem. tired. Sorry. Don't don't worry. About it. You know, Jax? Oh, I'll just deal with the baby. I'll go next after someone else. Oh. <laughs> All right. That's okay. so multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah. I have one thing to share. I mean, I'm not sure if it's quite pertinent, but um. It's just something that, like, I was, I was kind of been dealing with the last week, like trying to. <laughs> there's that bell again. Trying to uh, try to process it, I guess. I'm, I've been uh, dealing with a, a close friend. Uh, they're, they're like dealing with something quite personal. I won't share too many details, but it's regards to their family, and it's um, something um, not quite like a tragedy, but there's some trauma associated with it. And so they're like, they're just very. Um, probably the last two weeks even, they've just been very distant and pulled back. Um, and, you know, part of this practice, a practitioner, this this um, belief system is, you know, to want to be present and, and compassionate and, and be helpful, I guess, when we can be. So I, I guess I've just been trying to deal with, like, a sense of hopelessness, kind of just being idle and not being able to, uh, I guess, do anything. I know we're quite powerless, uh like all around like in our everyday lives anyway so the uh, the idea that like have like the ability to make a difference for someone else is kind of asinine and foolish anyway but uh, yeah i guess that's just one thing i've been trying to deal with so the um i guess the 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 little fable about the two-headed snake killing itself with the poison was uh I, I guess it sort of resonated with me because i'm feeling like when you're i don't know you can I guess make the choice for like others in your own actions. I guess by doing, or in this case, maybe not doing something. Like I said, I'm, not, I'm sorry if that's not pertinent, or maybe just sounds like rambling. That's why I usually never talk here. But 
Um, yeah, I guess that's just something that's been on my mind this week, I guess. I think you are uh, touching one of the most difficult human emotion uh, or feeling, which is the feeling of powerlessness. It doesn't really matter where it happens, you know, whether it's about your studies, whether it's it's your position at work, whether it's your marital situation, helping another or helping yourself. When we feel that we have no control whatsoever for what's going on, it tends to freak us out badly. Uh, I would say that it is probably one in in the top three fears, you know, maybe just right after the fear of death, the fear of not being in control of of sort of being a victim of life is a very difficult one. And um, it's a very, very interesting feeling to explore because there is great fear in there. Um, it, it's it's sort of us, and it's so quiet that we barely hear it, right? It's sort of us anticipating what could happen if we don't intercede, and then finding that whatever we do to intercede does not work, and so we just feel useless and insignificant, and it sort of steals the meaning of life away from us. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, Right, so I, I think you are um, you are bound to deal with that uh, feeling in different expressions many many times over life, and there's always a great opportunity for growth there, whether it's for your own personal powerlessness or for somebody else. And the answer to it is almost always surrender. Right, there's no use if you fight against life, you will always lose. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that you don't have power over everything. And that's sort of the first lie that for some reason we're telling ourselves. We we sort of think unconsciously that since we have control over so many things as humans, that we should have control over all things. That, that's never going to be true. We, we are a bunch of ants on this uh, as as individual. Or we are, we are as mighty as the universe, if we surrender to it and decide to be part of it. Uh, another thing I think is very interesting is that to love is often to give space. Okay. I was talking about the little fish in the bowl earlier and changing it so that the, the fish can grow. It, it is always true for a flower uh, as well. You're right, you need to put it in a bigger pot and give it more earth and more water and more sun as it grows if you want it to keep on prospering. Uh, but it's mainly about looking and providing the space that is necessary for growth. So that person, unless they are uh, you know, really seeing everything dark right now and they're really desperate and just beating themselves up when they close down, it might be that they need the space for healing as well. Or it might be that they need to be alone with their thoughts a little bit. And you can monitor. You can monitor the space to make sure that it doesn't get too dark, that it doesn't get too dangerous. But I believe that one great way to help people is to sort of be standing on the side, making ourselves available. They need a glass of water. They need a helping hand. If they need anything from us, we are there but we don't need to be in the space. The, the comfort will be there that you're nearby. So, wow. Does that make any sort of sense, uh, Frank? Oh yeah, a ton. Thank you so much for uh, answering my question. I know I didn't ask it very directly. So. Well, sure. I'm it's... gonna go to sleep now. Don't worry. <laughs> sleep night, well, Jared. Jared. Hope you sleep really well. Bye -bye. Yeah, good night Thank everyone. You. Sleep well. Oh, all. Good night, Jared. Good night. Good night. Oh, I wanted to warn him about the bed bugs. Get the chance. <laughs> 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 all right.
So just to keep on rambling a little bit about that sort of out of context this time, though. Space is something that is absolutely wonderful. It is, I, I believe, I became convinced over time that the nature of love itself is space. Space is love and love is space. They're kind of mingling together. And if you put it at the scale of the cosmos, you can see that this is a loving universe. It allows everything to exist within it. There's a sort of a harmonious existence to all of it. We don't really understand how it works, but it works like clockwork, like the universe is caring for itself. And, and so on some many small levels, uh, that's how we feel love also, you know? Let's say you're with a group of people. Let's say you're with your in-laws. So you're, you're with your in-laws and you have the type of in-laws that are always criticizing you. They're, they're making it very hard to move for you. They don't like the way you eat, the way you dress, the way you work, the way you nothing. So they're creating a very, very confined space. So would you feel loved in a very tiny, constricted space? Like Probably not. If your lover is saying, you cannot go out at night, you, you, you look like this when you dress like that, uh, you don't speak right, you don't see them. They're not allowing a lot of space for you to exist either. Uh, They've put boundaries all around you to keep you there. So that's not love either. But consider the opposite. Consider the loving family that allows you to sort of make your own mistakes and will, are there to help you afterwards, are there to nurture you, are there to advise, uh, won't give their opinion unless they're asked for it, uh, look at you with a smile, then probably you will feel loved and supported by those people just because they're giving that space to you. They're allowing you to exist and to flourish even if it's not always in the way that they would like or that they expect. So it's the, the awareness of space in a way is the awareness of love. Uh, and that's something that I try to be very attentive to when I relate with other people, how much space I'm giving them, how much space I'm, uh, I, I receive. And it's also about self-love. Sometimes I need to withdraw and take some time for myself. Uh, I need to go in the forest and just breathe some fresh air. I need to uh, raise my, my glance into open space and take all the, the view in. All of that space is sort of therapeutic. So it's uh, almost medicine. Right? Love cures everything, I would say. And to sort of master space, is is mastering our own health and and how to care for others. Uh, that makes sense. So uh, yeah, that's what I had about that. <laughs> Any other contribution today? Um. So the thing I was going to talk about with being angry, I can come back to that in a minute. I had a question related to what time being time being shared. Um, uh, one point about what you just said, Zenki, is you said only giving our thoughts or opinions if it's asked. I actually love it when people tell me their opinions because I don't always know when to ask. So I think it's about, I mean, it's different for different people and dynamics, but I think if it's done kindly, I love to always hear people's opinions. But my question was, if someone seems to be withdrawing or having a hard time, sometimes I'll reach out to someone, give them some, some care, or some good vibes, or maybe some Buddhist wisdom, and they're like, that was amazing, thanks, ah, oh, things are better. And sometimes they're like, seem to be not open to it, and they shut down, I try a little more, and, and then they're like, oh, wow, thanks. Sometimes they totally withdraw, and eventually... They're like, oh, thanks for keeping on reaching out. So uh, I was shutting down and I'm glad you were, tried to be there for, for me. And sometimes they like close off even more and just you try and give them so much help and they like 
just kind of just what's the word drag you along they'll be be there to receive a little bit and then just shut off again and then receive a little bit more and it seems to have not helped at all and then sometimes they've even like gotten angry and and like really reacted against me or mm -hmm. ended the friendship and uh yes. the times where i've helped people are so great and that motivates me to want to keep doing that but uh knowing how to read it or what to do has been uh something i would love to hear your thoughts on Oh, I, I have a, an answer that is so simple to that, that you're going to think I'm an idiot. Uh, <laughs> just ask. <laughs> you know, before you do any intervention with somebody, you can ask, are you looking for a companionship? Would you like me to listen? Or would you like some advice here? Right? And they tell you. They tell you. Uh, sometimes they will just say, oh, I just needed to vent. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. You've already done your job. I'm okay now. Uh, sometimes they will say, yeah, you know, I'd like you to listen some more. And sometimes they say, well, I really don't know what to do. What, what would you do in my stead? I have these ideas, but nothing seems to work, whatever. And then you know you can step in. The problem is that for some people, uh, you know, oftentimes they don't tell you what they have tried or how they felt and how, how they have gone about this problem. And it might feel like an intrusion, almost like a rape, that you come into their, their little world there and probe and try to uh, give advices or ask indiscreet questions. Um, and I, I learned about that, actually, uh, from a woman who was criticizing men. They were saying, oh, yeah, men are always there. To this. They listen to themselves talking, and they like to give advice, but they're not really paying attention to what the circumstances are. Right? And I started looking around, and I saw that I was doing that as well. You know, Like, I wanted to be helpful, so I was always sort of coming and trying to give a, a helpful advice. But I ended up uh, sometimes not being that well synchronized with what was going on. So just got into the habit of asking, uh, and uh, it works. I'd say just try that. <laughs> All right. So should I share my angry story now? Share your angry story, Neojix. <laughs> so, uh, Yesterday, I flew around the world, and uh, for some reason, I was imagining that we would have a lot of space on the airport, uh, in the airplane, and COVID-wise, we'd have things protected. Um, I have uh, the attitude towards COVID of, like, the medically advised one of be cautious, get vaccinated, don't breathe on each other, so... If someone else has a different attitude, just like try and go from where, I, like see it from where I'm coming from. So anyway, we were jam packed in the air in the airplane, and there were people all around with their masks off. There were people coughing, um, and I ended up feeling very judgmental towards humans. And then when we we're coming through the passport control, people are like jammed packed, trying to get through quickly, and uh, this old man comes up and he's like basically here over my shoulder with his mask off and like puffing like he's really ill and unwell and uh my baby's not vaccinated so we're being extra careful to try and protect him so i put my luggage there and made some space and tried to push him further away and he just came in more and more and after a couple minutes i was like told him to put his mask on told him to go further away Eventually, I was just like, fuck off, and like pushed him away. And uh, I've been thinking about it and protecting my baby's health. I definitely feel like I needed to make that space and that boundary. But I feel like I wasn't very skillful with my anger or with my interaction. Um, so, yeah, there's my angry story for the last day that definitely shook me up for quite a while. And I'm sure it wasn't a nice experience for him or his family. Um, yeah.
there you go. That's what I had to share. I think you're pretty much spot on, right? You, you were justified in your trying to protect your baby. Um, science is science. Uh, if we cannot at least find common ground around science, we're pretty much screwed. So I don't see you necessarily sort of being wrong there. But you said that you could probably I have handled old, man. that more. Yeah, you said you could have handled that more skillfully. I totally agree. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I unfortunately, it's uh, it's not one of those things. Like, I wasn't there, right? So I don't really, really know what you could have done differently. Uh, but I, I seem to go through life without shoving anybody, so I'm sure there was an alternative solution. <laughs> Uh, but I, I I understand that you were, you know, how if you if you analyze the emotions that you were feeling in this moment, how would you describe them? Because I think there is more than just anger there. Or maybe you could explain how this anger is arising from an emotional standpoint. Um. Yeah. I don't know if I would have called it anger. It was defensiveness. It was a bit of disgust. Um. Uh, it was, what's the word, where you just, yeah, I was definitely sort of dehumanizing this person, like how can they be so inconsiderate of our health and of all the social messaging about be careful and wear a mask and just give space, like how can and I hear that over and over and just completely disrespect it. But I think the biggest feeling I had was protectiveness, just trying to make sure my baby was safe and trying to give us some space. Um, but then in the moment when I said fuck off and pushed him, what was that feeling? Mm. Aggression. There wasn't Fear. aggression. It, it it wasn't like a, a a shove. It was a like a a fighting shove. It was a like get out of my space. Um, but then afterwards, I definitely felt aggressive. The the way um, his um, child then treated me, I I was imagining if he wanted to fight, I would have fought him. Um, but yeah. I don't think I shoved this old guy with aggression. It was, it was like, get out of here. I didn't want to hurt him in, in, in any way. I was just, get out of here. Um, interesting that you mentioned the aggression because now I reflect on it. It had definitely arisen around them, but no, I didn't have aggression towards him. Um, what else did it feel like? Ah! I don't know what the word is. I hope you can feel the feeling in that. <laughs> it sound. sounds like aggression. <laughs> I concur. Struggle. Like overprotecting, like overreacting, overprotecting. I don't think it was overreacting. I, I, him being in our space, if my baby got it, like I'd rather kill him than my baby catch it. Um. Uh, so here's the thing, here's the thing about anger that I, my, in my experience, is sort of universal. Uh, be, behind anger, there is always sort of a fear. And in this case, it's very obvious you were fearing that your baby would get infected. But generally speaking, it's just like, oh no, here's that person. Now things won't go the way I was expecting. Oh no, you know, the precautions I have been taking, all my hard work that I have been doing, it will all go to waste from now on because that person or that thing happened. So it's, it's often like that. And then what happens is that a mechanism triggers in yourself, which relates to the feeling of powerlessness that we were talking about. Uh, earlier time and you're sort of refusing you're like not true i won't allow that to happen and then you start to try and dominate the situation 
you 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 make yourself imposing and muscular and you take a deep breath and you're ready to fight for this situation to turn around so it's sort of your <laughs> taking your own fear and you're trying to make others afraid all of a sudden so that they don't come step on your territory and waste all the good work or all the good intents that you had. So whenever I feel angry about something, there is always like this idea that I am forecasting in my mind's eye a very undesirable outcome. And then I start of I start climbing up to the gate to defend that outcome that, that I was cherishing. So I was attached to the fact that, for example, I don't want my body to be infected, and I've taken precautions all the time. And darn, I hope you know that all all of this scare doesn't go through waste just through this flight, right? So. Uh, anger is an expression, although it is an expression that comes from fear, it also comes from self-love, uh, which I, I'd say is healthy. Uh, anger that is healthy comes from, from love, from self-love and saying, look, you know, I'm trying to do the, the right thing. I'm trying to preserve the, the beauty in my life and I'm trying to preserve my peace of mind and and these things are not allowing me, so I'm going to defend that, right? So we can see that also and as an ingredient, that there was love for your baby and love for, for the ways that you're trying to, to treat your baby. And, and obviously, that creates some attachment as well. And that's where you decide that you, you won't have it. So it's always the same mechanism with fear. Now the response, uh, you know, sh should you have spoken to a flight attendant to solve the old guy's uh, problem instead of, of shoving him? Uh, should your wife have spoken to him? Or, uh, you know, there, there are, I bet, a variety of ways this could have been handled. Uh, was shoving him necessary? I don't know. You know. My uncle and my grandpa used to say, yeah, don't waste your time explaining yourself. Get first and explain afterwards. They listen much better. <laughs> so that's one way of seeing it. Uh, I, I tend to try to explain myself before I eat. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but it's very interesting to look at the, the mechanism of how we uh, go from peaceful uh, to trying and dominate the situation by force, which I believe. In and 99% of the time is not the appropriate response. Um, however, you know, you I have this... I have tried to do it peacefully um, yeah. for minutes, and there were... I don't want to justify it, but yeah, I had tried that, and there was no security guards around because we were in a crowd of just so many people, jammed pack. Um, but yeah, once I decided I needed to change my approach, yeah, I guess maybe I could have just held the luggage out in the air rather than the ground. Or yeah, I could have asked my wife to speak. Oh, she'd already spoken to him as well. I just don't, I don't know what I could have done. And yeah, I also want to look within, like how could I have internally responded more effectively? I think that's that's what happened. You know, there was a, a moment of explosion within you that you probably didn't catch in time and it manifested into uh, actions, obviously. And uh, that's the only probably valid advice that I could share or, or the only thing you can pr practice one next time. Obviously, for this one, it's too late. <laughs> so uh, let, let's just have a thought for the old man today and for your baby <laughs> and may they all be well uh, but, but you know if, you, if you're if you talking about it I bet it's because you don't feel comfortable about it still and uh, it, it's good to bring that into your practice
All right. Well, thank you for sharing, though, uh, you know, Jax, it's well, from real life experience that we truly learn again. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So uh, let's do a silent meditation for the last 10 minutes, unless somebody else wanted to say something. Any other point we wanted to cover? Mm -hmm. Maybe just the clarification, one of your previous things that you said. This is yeah. really cool to hear about that, uh, you know, space is love mentality. Um, and like the example that you gave about your in-laws, um, they might be constricting you, judging you about every single action that you do. Uh, whereas mm -hmm. on, on the opposite sides, uh, if your in-laws are encouraging you and supporting you when you make mistakes, that's a much more freeing uh, mindset that just allows you to be more comfortable and explore more options yourself. So you obviously feel more love for them and maybe for, uh, for life uh, as well, being able to try out different new things that you wouldn't have been able to try out under judgment of angry in-laws. So what I'm wondering about is, um, uh, I, I read this book, uh, <laughs> uh, this one Buddhist book where they explain that freedom isn't always, uh, a good thing. Uh, freedom can always cause, um, paralysis when choosing things. Um, sometimes it needs a little bit more guidance, uh, on on life, maybe cons by constricting your choices, by constricting your freedom, by, you know, giving you less space. Like, for example, if you take a look at some Buddhists, there's tenets that they abide by, you know, they abstain from uh, sexual relationships and they live um, a rather constrained life. They choose it themselves, of course, but uh, that guides them towards um, a better life from their perspective. So. I'm wondering, how do you know when too much space might not be necessarily a good thing? Simple answer to that is when you cannot handle it. <laughs> you know, you could transgress any of the Buddhist rules or the Catholic rules or even the law if you knew exactly what you were doing. You know, for example, it's not good to speed on the highway, but it became almost a cliche that when a woman is about to give birth, even the police will escort her to the hospital and will go twice the, the allowed speed. We saw that in many movies, it must be true. <laughs> uh, so, you know, laws and, and tenets and commandments, they are transgression lines. They are uh, points where you should heighten your awareness uh, if you're going on the other side because there is trouble there. If you don't know exactly what you're doing, uh, refrain from it. I, I don't know if that exists in, in English, but in French we have this saying that says, in doubt, you know, refrain from it. So uh, I, I think that's sort of where those lines are drawn. Um, I think that Actually, freedom is very important to learn to manage and very early on. It's like, I'm going to give a crappy example, but that's all that comes to mind right now. It's like not teaching your kid about money, right? There are some parents that do that. They never speak about bills and about money and about taxes and about anything that's related to finances in front of their children. And what happens is that when the children are older, uh, sometimes they even get surprised that they have bills to pay and that those bills come every month and that because the cost of life is as such and they don't know much about saving money and they don't know much because they, they, don't, they didn't have any practice. They were not exposed to it. So I would say that uh, the ability to make choices when you are free um, is something that needs to be practiced. There is a uh, an old uh, Chinese fable of, of a guy who had uh, no legs and another one uh, who was blind. And um, there's a forest fire 
right next to their village, and so they must escape. But the guy without legs obviously cannot run away, and the blind guy, he doesn't know where to go. And so uh, the guy who had legs but was blind tells the other, hey, uh, you know, come on my shoulder. You will be my eyes. You guide me, and I will carry you, and that way we can escape the fire. Otherwise, we will both die. And this fable um, represents your heart and your mind. So uh, the mind is the agile, it's the legs. The mind uh, sort of has a technique and it can take you places, but it doesn't see, it, it doesn't really know what to choose, for example, or what the right course of action is. While uh, your heart provides the wisdom and the instinct and the, uh, the intuition that you need to select the right path. So when you are dealing with freedom and space and when you are claiming back this entire planet as your own, this entire universe as your own, it is important to use your heart-mind as a compass together. And then there is no need for constriction. The choices become more obvious because it's, you, it's your humanity making the choices for you. Um, I don't know if that answers, but I... I I see, like, not exposing yourself to freedom sort of as a, a peewee thing, right? Like, in the beginning, be careful. Like, don't, don't leave a four-year-old kid running around the pool. Uh, it's dangerous. They could drown. But if they've been well-educated for a number of years, then sure, they can be free around the pool, and they, they won't be, you know. When you know that they know how to swim, there's no problem there. So it's the same thing with freedom, I'd say. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, I get you. Uh, I guess from um, from the in-laws' perspective, yeah. it isn't always an easy choice. Uh, they might not necessarily know that um, what are giving you more or less space is 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 the right choice. Uh, so it's not yeah, always and, a clear-cut situation. And not a lot of people, to be frank, experience that growing up. You know, many of them had to live in a constricted, very small space with a bunch of rules. And, you know, they even got a kick in the butt when they transgressed. So it doesn't really teach you uh, how, how to give it to others. It's like that dog that spends 10 years on the leash and then you remove the leash, but he, he doesn't go outside of the boundary of the terrain. He still respects the length of the- Thank you, the, I think you muted yourself. The, Oh, mm -hmm. can you guys oh, sorry? hear me? No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah no, Jax, what did you say? You can't hear him? Or did my internet just cut out? I saw you, oh. you bouncing about a little bit. Do you bit. see I him? I think it might be your connection. Yeah, it could be. Do you see Zenke? Right, but the, the rest of you can still hear me, right? Hear. Yes, maybe. Yeah, yes, yes. Hear you, okay. Yeah, there's a oh, right. some times where maybe try reconnecting. Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm he, sure hears he's you guys. I don't think he can hear anyone. I'll shoot him a message on the... Oh, I'm signed up. Well, yeah, I can send him a message on Discord. Let's I think he can him. hear us, but maybe there is like we a ping or something. <laughs> pizza, pizza. Yeah, send him pizza, send him pizza. <laughs> pizza will not help. You, you, no, pizza yeah, always yeah, helps. Yeah, pizza yeah. always helps. <laughs> Yeah, right. If you're gonna give your loved one space and love, give them pizza. That's fine. Yes, that's all. <laughs> Wait, I, 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 that's that's not vegan pizza though. That's that's the issue. Uh, it's pepperoni pizza. All right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So the the dog on it's the actually my point was just that from a pepperoni a tree. Niche. Pepperoni grows on trees. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Ah, interesting. So, so basically what I'm saying is that those in-laws or those people that are unable to give the spaces that probably they don't even know that it's there or they can still feel like they're being choked when they transgress those lines and they don't want you to be choked. So they do it out of love, but they end up restricting you uh, dramatically. And that's not the way. But I, I believe, I think that everybody will learn that. I think, you know, that when we speak about it here, it makes sense to everybody. 
But you sort of need to be introduced to these notions softly, slowly, if you want to make them yours. Otherwise, it's counterintuitive. No, 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 you know, you should work, you should study, you should do this, you should not do that. People have those rules, the shoulds. Wherever there is a should in your life, you can be pretty sure that you're acting stupid. <laughs> and it's the same for people advising you any should or shouldn't. They made it up, you know? A big one is, for example, life should be pleasant. A lot of us think that, and when we're sad and when they're going to get stuff, we're surprised, and we're like, why me? Oh, why not? Life's like, like that, <laughs> right? So uh, I call that personal mythology, that system of belief that is made of should and shouldn'ts. Uh, one way to claim back the space that is yours is to get rid of that, unprogram that. It's not doing you any good, right? Well, some of them are good, like, don't put your hands on the live oven, uh, on the on the live stuff, or you know, don't jump off cliffs uh, without a shoe. Things like that are quite practical. <laughs> but beyond this, uh, you know, most of them don't. Most of them. Thanks, thank you. Sure. All right, let's do a little ten minutes silent meditation, and then we can descend. So we deeply get in the mood, then I won't say a thing, it's just appreciate the silence, which is itself full of love and space.
All right. So I guess we managed to get in there, relax a little bit together. And, um, well, I don't have the official dedication, but let's just um, hope that everything we have learned and practiced today can benefit uh, people that we love, our acquaintances, and even people that we don't know as we move about the world and try to be in harmony with everything. So thank you all and have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. And Neil Jax just left. I think uh, since he's in Europe, he won't be doing the session at night. So I will uh, taking care. I will be taking care of another session. He has days, become so. one of us. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you guys are too concerned about this, but I just thought I'd, I'd share if you want to go back later. Some reason still alive. I'll, I'll be there around seven soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you, Danke. Cusp